So real quick, I want to get a feel for the audience so that the panelists can uh, hopefully best address the questions through the presentations of who they're presenting to. How many uh, municipal planners do we have in the audience? Okay. And then how many are interested in community engagement through uh, development? Through development, okay. Um, a few. And what about just private sector uh, planners that are, or uh, architects that are just practicing uh, community engagement through projects? So private sector. Okay. So. And other. <laughs> what else is there? What, what do you guys What else is there? <laughs> Community organizations. Community organizations. Nonprofits. 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 Academic. Academic. Always for the yeah. And are there any pissed off community members here? <laughs> oh, we got to do better outreach. <laughs> okay, so um, we've got some exciting presentations. I'm going to let them uh, go through. Q&A. We have about 15 minutes of Q&A. These are going to be seven-minute presentations. We encourage heckling. This is a lightning round. Heckling oh, this. There you go. See? Highly encouraged. I was telling people prior to the session, I was like, we need to heckle the panel because it gets you like on your toes. And they should be hitting this really quickly, uh, hitting all the highlights. Like, yeah. <laughs> This is a very rapid thing, and I'm eating into their time now. So with that, we're going to go ahead and kick it off. And uh, Will is going to come up here and do a presentation about Eugene, Oregon, and the mapping process that they went through uh, their engagement process. Who is this guy? <laughs> OK, we have uh, somebody from here. So I'm Will Dowdy, and um, I'm an urban designer for the city of Eugene, Oregon. Um, am I supposed to get the slide up? Or is that someone else? Is there anyone else? Is that me? That's you. <laughs> Take responsibility. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> technical assistance. No, I'm just kidding. We it worked when it was a PC hooked up. Oh, it's a Mac issue. Hey, why, why do you have tech problems? What's your Twitter username? What's your Twitter username? I don't have one. Oh, you don't? No. What? So follow Steve and John instead of me. Um, but what I'm going to do today is join a long list of memorable CMU presenters and try to present far too many slides in a single presentation. Uh, so if you all are with me, we will try to make history today. There you go. All right. Let's try. And there it is. History nope. begins. It was. Yep. Okay. So uh, we are talking about <laughs> mapping value in Eugene, Oregon. Um, who here has heard Joe Minicosi speak or seen his stuff online or anything Joe Minicosi heard? Who's heard his name about a dozen times this week? So I'm going to talk about what happens when Joe Minicosi comes and speaks to your uh, community and then he leaves. Or if you go here and at a place like this. So there's Joe. So Joe came to our community uh, a couple of years ago and people came out of the session with their eyes like this. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. So the first thing we did um, is we put together a good team because good teams, um, you need to combine technical expertise and you need to combine some vision and a little bit of everything. But the thing that Joe does that uh, he's famous for is the map. If you've seen this on blogs, uh, you've, seen this, you've seen this presentation, he does this map where he maps uh, taxable value in cities and you can see our downtown and you can see our uh, university. The downtown is the spot where all the colors are and the university is the space right next to it. But uh, we, so we made the map. We were asked by a few people in the community to make a map. You know, hey, can we do this? And we said, sure, we can do that. But it turns out a map is actually like a self-portrait of the community. And any good self-portrait requires testing, comparing, fixing, and then you do that all over again. So here's Eugene at south of where we are now. Uh, this is the map of the city. I've already showed you downtown, which is the pink, the green is the university. Um, that's Eugene. This is Eugene. Actually, about five years ago, this is uh, some of the prime real estate in the downtown. Um, who, who here has been to Eugene? Okay, who here lives in Eugene? Oh, perfect. Um, so this is a uh, yeah, prime real estate downtown. If you were here yeah, five years ago, maybe you, you would have seen these pits. We uh, wrapped uh, plastic around them when we had the, um, the Olympic uh, trials because we wanted people to think that something was happening. Uh, but something did happen. Uh, here's our main, main intersection. Uh, not much, but with some time, we've had a lot of projects. Uh, a lot of investment in downtown, and uh, there may be some issues with the details, but generally people here are supportive of this kind of thing. Each one of these has been an incredible fight. So that's where Joe's message of the investment in downtown really comes in. Joe's big thing is that uh, you to take your value and you divide it by acreage to understand the, uh, the potency of land. 
But it turns out that there's lots of different ways to talk about value. So this is one of the first things that we had to wrestle with. So there's real market value, which is basically an approximation of what you pay for the land. But that has almost no correlation to taxes in the state of Oregon. So there's assessed value, which has more to do with it. But the problem is that if you see up on the north side, there's the wastewater treatment facility. So every time we show this map to people, they say, oh, well, what's that big blue thing up there? We say, well, that's, that's actually just um, where the sewage goes. And, and so they, this map didn't quite do the trick. This is taxable value, which is the, the map we ended up using. But again, one of the many kinds of value. Uh, here's a comparison of taxable and assessed value. Um, we'll just move on. Uh, total taxes. Uh, the problem with taxes is that it has to do with what your taxing districts are. So you start to get some um, arbitrary bureaucratic things and rather than just the, the simple value. It gets even worse when you look at just um, what's giving money to the city. So we have all of these things. This is the fact that we have a lot of unincorporated land. All that yellow land is unincorporated, um, but basically still within the city. So, uh, so there's a lot there. And actually, this is our, what our um, GIS analyst uh, Thought was, a, was, thought was a good metaphor to explain wrestling with the, um, the GIS data. So one of the issues that you come up with is you have vertical tax lots. So these are all condos within one parcel. How do you map this? Because they all have different values assigned. Some of them are really small. We found a, a, like a supply closet that had a huge value. It was the, it was the most profitable part, part of the city was a supply closet. Well, that's a distortion. That's not actually a, a, a representation of the way the city works. We have these circle lots, which is a crazy pod thing from, I think, the 70s. Um, it, when you map this stuff, it, it really doesn't work. Uh, your city may have that too. So one of the things that we did, one of the um, the, uh, the the ways that we went about with our, our self-portrait thing was we talked to a citizen group that really knows the technical stuff. We talked with a, a GIS user group. We talked with the county. We talked with staff. They told us, well, you actually need to look at not just property taxes, but machinery and equipment, because we've got a lot of industrial land that is paying a lot of taxes, but not for the property, but for the stuff that's in it. So we start to refine our work. Other people said, well, it's not really fair to do, it's not apples to apples comparison when you um, are looking at downtown, because downtown, like the Star, that's the downtown athletic club, really high value thing, but the building next to it, where the P is, that's the parking for it, that's a different parcel. But if you build an athletic club on the edge of town, the parking is on the same parcel. So they said, hey, you're cherry picking the data. So what we did is we took these squares and we said, well, let's take everything within this. And this way, we take in the ex externalities, the things that are not included when you're dealing with a downtown grid. It also takes into account the, the uh, number of streets that you have and the width of the streets and things like that. Uh, public buildings, parks. So we did a map based on that uh, to ignore the circle and the arrow. Um, and it, what we found is that the same story still applies. So those are facts, but we realized that facts aren't enough. The storytelling is actually where we really need to go with this. One of the issues is politics. Because uh, people like to say, well, you're just using this to you know, convince us to do such and such. Well, I like to compare it to personal finance software. If you've got one of these things with your credit card or your bank, you know that it will tell you that you spent a ridiculous amount of money on watching movies or food and dining or whatever it is. It doesn't actually judge you. It doesn't say ridiculous amount. What it does is it says you spent 45% of your income on watching movies. And then you get to make the decision. And that's what we think that this map does. This map shows us where our money is, shows us what we're doing with it. But it doesn't actually judge. And that's up to the decision makers in our community, whether they're elected or just the community at large. So what we did to present this information, we have created a booklet. It hasn't gone live yet. You're seeing it before, well, really before our communities. But we wanted a teaching opportunity. So the first thing we did in the booklet is we said, because if you know Eugene, what we like about Eugene, the reason why we're all there, or at least we think we're all there, is for quality of life. So we said quality of life. If you like biking along the river, if you like riding on the river on a raft, if you like going to the arts, the, um, that quality of life, it, it, it comes from something. It comes from some money. So the way city government works is money comes in, and then services go out. So does this really impact me? Yes. Everyone's involved. So we, we get a little bit of uh, definitions, explaining uh, some of the terms we're going to use, like what is tax, what gets taxed. Uh, and then we talk about the way that you know, you actually know uh, this, this kind of way of thinking of, <laughs> of uh, value per acre. Because when you're buying bananas or when you're buying meat, you don't just say, well, I bought some meat and it was $5. It was a really good deal. You want to know how much you pay per pound. And that's really all that we're doing here. 
So we, uh, we do these bar charts to explain the different way of thinking, what, what, uh, what Minicozzi and Urban 3 does um, explaining what? I'm at seven minutes, okay. So, uh, so then we finally get to our map, but then we come back to explaining that it's about, uh, it really is, it's about more than money. Uh, so triple bottom line, and we're going forward, we're going to be working with Urban 3 to help us get into the next part, which is not just about how much money we're pulling in, but how much money are we putting out, that's the full picture. Thank you. And we apologize for the technical difficulties. We think that was the only PDF, and hopefully that's the reason it was doing the uh, popping along. But um, so we're going to run into uh, a keynote. So let's see if this hopefully helps us, helps ourselves. Um, and Timo is, is going next. And um, have you all heard about what Helsinki did with their their master plan? This is going to be an amazing story um, where it's a uh, citizens becoming so engaged that they're uh, they're changing uh, politics and uh, making it happen. So I think this is a very exciting presentation. This is like micro skills for me, so I apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Thanks, Apple, for changing the course again.
Uh, and anyways, um, the brightest idea we came up with was to create a parallel alternative plan, master plan to challenge uh, Helsinki's official uh, master plan process. And not just any kind of plan, we decided to do one that would act as a kind of true manifestation of the urbanist, ideal urbanist city that way too often gets neglected. So content-wise, uh, we decided to double the amount of future Helsinkians compared to the official plan. And we also introduced a denser development model that will simultaneously help save uh, green spaces and also <coughs> help make more vibrant neighborhoods. And content-wise, we wanted to make a plan that would evoke emotions. So we decided the best way to do that was to kind of build on the success and beauty of historic and drawn urban visions. Uh, they're very good and kind of easy to understand messages. They're not, they're quite simple. And uh, with these basic principles, we then started working for nine to 10 months in our free time on this project. And finally, about a month before the city came out with its own official plan, we launched this uh, Pro Helsinki 2.0, the alternative master plan for Helsinki. And what happened next was far beyond our expectations. The plan went viral, the media made multiple stories on us. Uh, we were invited to share ideas with the city planning department, uh, leading politicians, other key stakeholders, and at various grassroots events. Uh, so basically everybody felt like they needed to have their say uh, on plan. And I think ultimately our project to make noise about the urbanist agenda via a do-it-yourself master plan turned out to be a terrific idea because uh, it provided a platform that pushed people to think and articulate whether they share our vision or some parts of it or want something completely different. And thus, it got many fellow citizens engaged uh, with sharing their ideas about future Helsinki. And perhaps more importantly, this proved to be the case among experts as well. So, for example, when Helsinki's politicians were deciding on the specifics of the official master plan, they also had our plan laid out on the negotiation table. It's uh, a key point of reflection. So, uh, I think with our Popsky 2.0 plan, it's safe to say we managed to hack Helsinki city planning and make a little bit more room for uh, better urbanism. And I hope our example will inspire you to do something similarly crazy in your city and to help with great change. And uh, here are my contacts. If you want to get in touch later on, I'm also going to be here for a uh, conference. And you can find my blog at urbanfinland.com. So I write about Finnish planning and in English. So you're very welcome to read my plan. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Leonards. I'm uh, with the National Shred Institute. Recently, up until recently, as the director of the National Shred Institute, uh, NCI is now at Michigan State University. I'm no longer director, but I'm faculty. And uh, there's, a, there's a new. Go green. <laughs> Go great. Uh, anyway, I am uh, representing Michigan State University and NCI today. So uh, here we go. Um, <clears throat> many years ago, a friend of mine, Peter Katz, encouraged me to write a book called The Charette Way. And now that I don't have to be the director anymore, and I can consult and write a book, I'm working on it. And so you're going to get a little bit of this. Uh, <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of ideas around the Charette Way. I'm going to touch on a few of them. I'm going to be a little bit about the energy of a Charette, almost spiritual about it, if you will, but I think I've been around long enough to, to, to be able to talk about that. <clears throat> um, the learnings of the Charette Way come from 30 years of doing hundreds of Charettes by many people and learning what are the values that are put into action in a Charette in projects like this. How can we transform a situation through a charrette? How can we take, for instance, people who are at the end of their rope and <clears throat> acting like this? Um, could you have me like a little water there? 
Thank you. <clears throat> and how can you get people to work together? How can you change the way people work together? That's really what we're doing. Uh, and it started by designers. And I wanted to speak to probably the most important thing that the scene you can do. And that is use the design process. Oh, I see we're flashing again. I'm sorry. Using the, the design process as a way to engage people. And it started way back in the 1800s and then in the 40s. It's been going on for a long time. But it's this process of what I would call embedding people in the design process. That's what we do. At some point, we as designers recognized that we had a really powerful tool called design. And it was a powerful way to engage people energetically in a project. And it's got to do with creating these places, these charrettes, where this incredible design activity goes on. And it's like barn building. You know, the real purpose of barn building is community building, right? The barn is just a way to build a community. So how can you use a project to build community? Rule number one, the best charrettes are ones where people listen and empathize and understand the values of the people and the needs of the people who are affected and affect the outcome. Listening to people, give them a voice. And then number two is trust. So once you engage the people, you have to bring trust to it. Trust for everybody in the equation. And using design as the tool. So here you have a charrette moment where community members are engaging with a designer. It's a powerful way to change people's perceptions. Tactic urbanism. You don't have to draw. You can just go out and do it. <laughs> That's another design opportunity, doing it on the ground. This happened with Steve Coyle and the group in California years ago, right? We did this in a charrette. This was a charrette moment. So at NCI, we've looked at these levels of stakeholder involvement. There are always like about three levels. And the challenge that we have, whether you use a charrette or not, OK, this is basic public involvement. How do you get people happy with how they're involved, even though they're not involved in more than other people? Some people are involved more than others. How do you do that magic? And it has to do with feedback loops. So we're engaging people in a flow, a creative flow of design. People get engaged in a flow through feedback loops. And it's exciting. It's creative. One little story about feedback loops. I won't mention where this was. There's some new urbanists in the picture. But the man standing there in feedback loop number one with looking really worried owns a piece of property in this area. And he's a church pastor. And his church just did the great thing of assembling all this property and turning it into a parking lot. Right? And the neighborhood is upset about it. But he says, but I've got parking for my parishioners. Well, we're saying, come on in. Feedback loop number one, and he's going, oh my god, this is bad, right? And so our people start working on it. Feedback loop number two, notice his body language is a little bit more open at this point. This is on the second day, OK? And we're doing our magic as designers. We're using design to say, what about this? Did you think about that? And our designer is saying, Jeff Farrow is saying, here's a win-win for you. So check out feedback loop number three. Aww. Here's my car. Happy, I can take this to my people. It takes at least three feedback loops to do this with people. In anything. I'm not talking, even when I'm working with my 15 year old son. Okay? It's like, you know, let's just start feedback number one on the all night party. Okay? And feedback loop number two, we'll discuss feedback loop number three, maybe we're not going to the all night party, right? So, Three feedback loops with people, we've learned. But then extend that to the whole project. How do you run a project the way you run a charrette? More feedback loops. Not just the charrette, but the whole project. So it's an orchestration, it's a dance that you create with people, making sure they feel great about how they're involved in the flow, that they're involved with creativity. Final slide, latest thing we're doing 
This was created with Doug Farr for his new book. He's helped us think about other ways to do design process. On the bottom is the classic seven-day Cadillac charrette that hardly anybody does. And on the top is a three-day model. The feedback loops, and I'm sorry this is flashing so much for you guys, but the feedback loops are all there. This is low complexity. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this 30 years and this has never happened. Low complexity, high complexity. Political complexity, complexity of the design problem. The more complex, the more number of days you need. The less complex, you can get by with less. So there's a taxon, there's a lexicon, lexicon of this thing. Okay, that's my little thing. So you can find us at charetteinstitute.org. <clears throat> we are at Michigan State now. I'm not there, I'm still in Portland. There's going to be a new director, by the way. The posting went out today. If anybody wants to be the new director of NCI, faculty position at MSU, we're looking for a good new urbanist. Okay, thank you. Okay, so my name is Margaret Wallace Brown. I am, um, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that I prove that planners do exist in Houston, Texas. I know many of you have heard that they don't exist, but I'm living proof that we do have planners in Houston, Texas. I'm Deputy, <laughs> Deputy Director of the Planning and Development Department. And we have a couple open positions that people are interested in. Uh, so a couple months ago, I had a brainstorm. I had a really brilliant idea. I wanted to come to this group and ask you all to have a brainstorming session with everybody in the group on what their best ideas for, for civic engagement was. I thought we could all share great ideas, bad things you should stay away from, what, what works, what doesn't work. We could record it, and then I could give it all back to you, and we could all go home with great information. Then I realized I had seven minutes. So I couldn't do that. So what we what I resulted to, what I backed, fell back on is I've been doing this brainstorming with everybody here all week. I actually started it in Houston a couple of days before I left Houston, but I've been asking many of you, and I know there's a couple people in the room that are actually on this video. So we've been doing brainstorming all week. And so what I'm going to show you is a video of people's best ideas that they shared with us, and then we can all learn from that, and then maybe we can the conversation on Twitter or on Facebook or something like that afterwards. So um, here we go. Oh, Cross your fingers. <laughs> Can't talk about someone or at someone 
if you haven't spoken with someone. And when you do it, you have to do it on their turf, not your turf. Building community is about making sure that as many voices in the community are represented as absolutely possible. Right. Uh, I think it's important in civic engagement to remember that when people get upset, it means they really care. We need to, for instance, get away from visual preference surveys and let people take their own photos of what they like, dislike, and uh, how they are inspired by what they see. The one thing that's most important is listening to everyone. You can't pick one out, and everybody's idea and thoughts aren't good. I think the most important thing to do for community engagement as well in an agency or a firm or board is doing it is to actually clean it, to not just do it in the pro forma we have to do it sort of way, and to actually want to receive an actual feedback and show that you mean it to the people that you're seeking feedback. And I think best practices to engage residents are to meet them on their own turf. conversations with about 20 people. That feels like a level of conversation where everyone can participate, but no one's on the spot. I would say to approach the matter uh, as a partnership and not uh, coming with a predefined solution that's being interpreted as being forced on a group. Uh, be open and uh, work with the, with the people or the uh, audience at large to make sure they feel included from the beginning. For public engagement, I try to work on my three-to-one rule. Let's facilitate three times the community interaction for every one unit of presentation. For example, have 45 minutes of dialogue after only 15 minutes of presentation and not the other way around. So the most important thing for me for community engagement is the feedback loop, and so going back to the community and letting them know um, what you took into consideration and what you did to change based on your input. So again, it kind of softens the fatigue that uh, stakeholders have. So uh, I am going to say some things that may come across as kind of insulting. 
especially to the experts that run charrettes out the wazoo, I think that you do a really shitty job most of the time. Even the ones that are highly successful that you walk around patting yourself on the back, the, most of the community, we don't know that it ever happened. And you think that you did a really good job of engaging us, and you think that you listened, and then you went back to your ivory tower in the sky, and we feel really left out. The most left out people are the ones that we're supposedly designing the cities for in the future. Who would those be? Children. Young people under the age of 18. How often are you asking people under the age of 18 what they want their city to look like? Are most of your shreds filled with people over 50? Yes, they are, because who has extra time? People over 50. People under 18 have time too, but nobody thought to ask them. So I want to play a, a little audio file real quick for you guys. Let's start right at the beginning. What motivates you to be an activist in your community? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think it's seeing injustices around me and recognizing my privilege from a very young age that allowed me to see the contrast and try to work towards equalizing that out. When I was younger, I grew up in a very low-income household, but I was still doing better, and I felt like I was doing better than a lot of my peers, and I saw how they were treated unjustly through a system, not by any one individual. And as I got older, and I could put words to that, and I could work on actual topics, I could change that, it really manifested into creating a space for other people to do the same thing. So can you remember the first time you found yourself getting involved in becoming an activist? Was there a particular cause or event? Um, you know, I don't know about when I was little very much so, because I don't think I ever really had the chance. It was more like when I was in high school. I remember the first thing I ever volunteered for. I was advocating for the inclusion of complete streets in a competitive grant process for cap and trade funding. So it was to advocate that when they looked at the grantees who were asking for grant funding from the cap and trade money, that they included that the applicants had to have complete streets and transportation solutions for a lot of different people in their application. So I played that because what I hear a lot of times when I talk about engaging young people in, uh, it's done in, in uh, to be honest, sort of a superficial way. We're gonna, sure, we're gonna engage them, but they're too young to really know anything about what I do. I'm an expert, I've gone to college, I'm all very smart. Um, I know more than the community members do. I have to teach them. You know, I'm gonna hear their ideas, but then I'm gonna process it because I can understand things, and at the end of the day, you know, I'm the expert and they're just regular people. And what I have found, I've been looking for a way to like hack the system, right? How do you decentralize power? If we're constantly in the same game of like who are the least engaged community members and how do they get access to driving the decisions of the future that are going to make the communities of their future, why don't we just hand control over to them? Really, like actually fully, not like I want to hear you and then I'm going to go to my office and I'm going to do things and I'm going to come back and show you what I've done. Like, no. Why don't they go to their classroom and do it themselves and then they show you and then you help them modify and refine it and then they drive it. They are the boss. You work for them. They are the ones actually doing the work themselves and through so doing they're learning how to be designers and architects and planners and economic development specialists and all of the things that we want to teach young people how to do and they're, they're getting invested in their communities and this came to me because I lived through this. This is, um, in 2011, we had 67 tornadoes in Alabama that hit in one 24-hour period. It took out, 80% um, uh, of our state was a federally declared disaster zone. Um, this is the tornado that ripped through, um, it started on the Mississippi state line, and it stayed on the ground all, almost all the way to Georgia. Um, it was a mile and a half wide. They had to come up with a new name for tornadoes after this thing because it didn't fit any of the patterns, it didn't behave. It was called a supercell, just like Superstorm Sandy. Didn't behave because it was not a hurricane. Um, they had to come up with a new lexicon because what it did to us. I took these photographs. Um, this is about a mile from my house. My neighbor and I just sat there watching this thing go by because we knew if it hit us, there was no hiding from it. Um, it uh, many of the tornadoes ripped grass out of the ground. There were no basements left. Um, it killed 256 
Alabamians that day. It killed over a thousand people throughout the southeast. Um, it's the deadliest tyrannic outbreak that has ever been documented anywhere in the world. And most of you probably have never heard about it. You don't want really to have a disaster on a busy media cycle. Um, the president assassinated Osama bin Laden um, two days after that. So we lost a lot of media coverage, all the trucks left, and so we didn't get a lot of help. So when it comes to um, the community engagement process that happened, um, AIA, we have a really strong AIA chapter, American Institute of Architects chapter in Alabama, and they did a really wonderful thing in trying to pull together a RUDAC, which I, as a regular citizen community member, had never um, heard of and didn't know what it was. And it's apparently, um, I, I, now that I, I flipped through it and I was one of the, the community members that got pulled in, I was sent to the National Charette Institute. They came to town and they taught us the locals, the regular people, what a charrette was, and how we could run it ourselves, and how we were going to be the subject matter experts. And um, th it, they did, a, um, what you do is you get the community members to actually drive the history, you teach the experts, like what is the history of your community, what's important to you, etc. This process was really successful in many ways, and AIA goes around the country and talks about how successful this RUDAP program was, and it was successful in many ways. But it was missing a huge contingent which was anyone under 50. And so I kept saying, hey guys, you know, I really think that you're missing out on young people. We really need to reach out to them. And they were like, yeah, we're really super engaging everybody. And I'm like, but you're not. So um, my sister reminded me when I was like super pissed that nobody would listen, like none of the experts would listen to me. Um, and my sister was like, you know, you're a school teacher. You could just do it yourself. And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm supposed to be the doer. So um, I did it myself um, with no money and no support or assistance from the city whatsoever and really um, just pulling together the people that I knew that were like me and felt kind of pissed off about the situation as well. Um, I did a writing uh, assignment with this. I went to the school in the neighborhood that was affected. This is a historically impoverished, disinvested, poor black community. I know that's a shocking thing that there are communities of color that are hit by disasters on the daily. Um, and I went to the, um, the English teachers and I put out a writing assignment with them and I said, I want you to put this out to your students and I don't actually care what their grammar or spelling is and then they all are like, oh my God, no. And I said, just, I want to just get like genuine, honest feedback from the young people about, it said, do you want to change the world, win this writing contest and I'll show you how. And because it turns out that young people really do want to have control over their destiny. And so we did this writing assignment, the uh, teachers collected like 60 essays, and I, ran, I read through all of them, and that dictated what I was going to, to the experts that I would bring in, because they told me what they wanted their community to be. It was called My Crack City, what I want my community to be. And I asked them the question, like, what would this city need to be for you to want to live here? What does it need to be for you to stay here for college or come back from college? Etc. And they told me they had very clear ideas as to what they wanted built back first. They wanted the car wash to come back, um, which really surprised me because I was like, "That's weird." It was kind of a dumpy car wash. And they're like, "That's where every Sunday everybody in the neighborhood hangs out. That's where I get to see my friends, my family. That's where they fellowship after church. Is at the car wash." So the car wash was a lot more than a car wash, and I wouldn't have known that. They know that. And. Uh, they said, you know, cars drive too fast in front of the school. My little sister was almost hit by a car. I've almost been hit by a car. So I was like, oh, I need a transportation engineer. Oh, I need somebody from economic development. So I let their essays drive the experts that I brought in. And then the next step was to find the experts. This took me about two weeks. I reached out to a bunch of um, people throughout the city that I knew. And I said, hey, I've heard of transportation engineering. Can you, uh, can you come and talk? You only have five minutes. And you have to talk at a fifth grade level, and the transportation engineers were like, we can't do that. And I was like, that's why nobody knows what you do. Um, so <laughs> they, I found a transportation engineer that could. I've got an economic development person. They came in. Um, they got their 10 minutes to speak. The young people um, got to ask them questions. It was very messy and sloppy in the beginning because the young people have never been put in a position of power. And I hijacked a lot of this from Martin Luther King Jr. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, so the civil rights movement is deeply entrenched um, in what I think that Dr. King did a lot of great things. And one of the things that he did is put the young, the very young children, pull them out of school and put them on the front lines of the marches. And what it did is it put a much different face to the disparity of what has happened, the impact of what is happening. And so by the politics of Birmingham are so terrible that there was not going to be a lot of action from adults 
because the, the mayor had gotten in a fist fight with a city council member from this neighborhood, and then he wasn't going to let any money go into it. But by the time these young people were done with a two-day session, and I can give you guys information as to how to do this in your community for like practically no money, and it's super easy, um, they were able to, after only two days, they were fully articulate about what they wanted, how they wanted to do it, which buildings they wanted to revitalize, because I told them that they could do it themselves. I would help set them up with a law firm, they could create a nonprofit, they could fundraise, they could hire a designer, they could hire the architect, they could do it themselves, and they're like, us, oh, we're just kids. And I said, the Olsen twins were managing a multi-million dollar empire by 16. And they were like, oh, hmm, true. So everything that we did, I, I, every time they'd say, I want this, I would make them repeat. I pledge to be the change I want to see in my community. They had to take ownership. If they wanted a stop sign, day two of the engagement was that they had to do research on what it cost to do all the things they wanted to do. And then they had to figure out how to fundraise because I taught them if you're going to go to city council, you take a bird in hand and you say, huh, look, we have researched and found out that a stop sign that we very desperately need so that we don't die is $250. And we've raised $250. We would like little children. We would like to partner with the city and we would like for you to install our stop sign. We've already raised the money. Now, do you think any city council member is going to say no to children that are asking to not die while crossing the street to go to school? No. Because you don't want to be the mean asshole like adult that does that. So what I did is the, the accidental byproduct, and I know I'm way over my time, but way over. But this is important. This is the hack for how to decentralize, you have politics at play, right? There's the squabbling and all of this. People don't get in the, adults get out of the way of kids, right? These young people, they get out of the way. They say, oh, let's lift them up. Oh, they're doing things themselves. Yes, it's so cute. It gets us good media. The mayor loves it. Everybody looks like a savior. But really what has happened is now these kids, this was six years ago, they all went on to go to school. The, one of the young men, this young man right here, he keeps in touch with me. He has now, it took him about um, two years after this, he started his own fund to fund other young people to get into tech college, right? They're starting their own foundations. Now, two days, it took two days, right? This is not like a, a long-term thing that, that it takes tons of money and a lot of effort. This is very simple, and so I want to encourage you all to know that the, the children are our future. Um, and you need to engage them and treat them like they are um, intelligent, functioning people and that they, they actually need to be the ones running things. And you are there only to serve, to facilitate for them and teach them the language to tell you what you need to do for them. We have time for a Q&A. So we got change agents hitting it from all perspectives. We have experts that from the NCI. Uh, Shred Institute and a, a municipal planner that shows how to do it in the city. So uh, with that, we're going to open it up to questions for the panel and we can pass the mic around so that everyone can hear the question. Any questions? So I 100% agree with you about involving young people and as a planner who runs Shreds, uh, it's something that I also prioritize. Do you have any tips as to how to get them to show up? Um, so I, gosh, I've put out flyers at high schools, I've spoken at university events, um, I've engaged with a bunch of people who've promised to come, uh, who tell me they're excited and they're going to come, uh, young people, and then they don't show up. So any, any tips on how to get them to actually commit? Um, well, my, my young people, um, and, and then we, I'll throw it over to you. Um, by the way, the, the girl that I played the voice of in the beginning, she's 16. By the way, I didn't even know what cap and trade was. I had to Google it. She got a $2 million grant, by the way. She runs a nonprofit that she started in her school. Um, so <laughs> um, I knew that I had to feed them because they don't get food on the weekends in this neighborhood. So um, I, I told them that I would give them the power to control their own destiny and I would feed them. And I had 20 slots and I had 22 show up. Because what I didn't count on is them bringing their younger siblings that didn't have food at home either. So they all showed up. That was Saturday and Sunday, 15 of the 20 showed up again. And the principal and the teachers came in, they were like, we don't understand, because they're like, oh, nice white lady, this is not gonna work. And then all of a sudden they're like, how did you get these kids to show up on the weekend? I was like, I empowered, I, I simply t told them that they would get to be in charge. That's all they really wanted. When we work with 
kids. We often work with them younger than that, like in the middle school age, so they're not driving. What we'll do is we'll do tandem events with their parents. So the parents come and but pizza, definitely pizza, food, donuts, you name it, whatever, whatever you think will work in the food department. But also, because we are working with people who are limited means, and so we bring, we feed their parents, and we do some tandem exercises with them, and then the kids go home and, you know, talk to their parents about it, and then we do feedback loops and things like that also with, with that group. So it's, it's building a relationship. It's all so about building a relationship. So you, you connect with the teachers, make it a project. You know, ask the teacher ahead of time if it can be a project. And then what's nice what she said is that they do the project and then they come, however you do it, but if they come to the public meeting, then the parents come along because they go where the kids are. in response to um, the question that was asked previously it, as to like tips to have you show up. Um, based on my experience volunteering in high school with the number of social justice organizations in San Francisco, one thing I found uh, interesting that got a lot of youth involved was um, they tended to have icebreakers in the beginning so that way all the youth in the room would feel comfortable with one another. Of course, feed them as well and uh, of course definitely take the time to get to know them if they like playing video games, play video games with them. Um, if they like, um, uh, yeah, that's just one example that I have, so uh, that's something to consider. Hi, I have a question for all of you, and it's about um, follow-up and accountability. So often you see charrettes happening, and it's all great, and everybody has great ideas, and then you hear nothing. <laughs> And then a site plan comes out, and 10 years later, there are different people living there or in, in the room and different developers working on the project. So what have you guys done to actually keep people engaged that participated and incorporate new voices as you have more of a transient population coming in and out? Um, and then keeping the people accountable, whether that's the government or developers or a combination of both. Yeah. So. Uh, NCI strongly recommends there's a quick follow-up after a charrette or any kind of major design event. So the message afterwards, and I like the way that I got this from Dover Cole, they call it the work in progress presentation at the end, and they say come back in four weeks. In the meantime, get engaged with our website, social media, we're going to readjust, we're going to be back. So I always recommend coming back for another meeting, like a, a, you know, four weeks, five weeks, no more than six weeks later. Because after you run a charrette, no matter how good it is, something went wrong. And you're going to have stuff stirred up. And what's great about coming back pretty quickly is you can deal with that stuff. Pretty quickly. So that's just one, one idea. There's a whole bunch of other ideas. But that's one. Use your committees. You know. Now, the, the worst thing is dead air. The worst thing is dead air. You have to really continue to engage people. Get out there, find out what's going on in the street, have your people out there tell you what's going on. So for me, um, they, they were running it. After the two days, we did a walking on it where we, I went back and walked through the neighborhood with them and they pointed out which buildings they wanted to, they wanted to buy. And then they did they ask like how do we buy a building? What do we how do we do that? And I said, Well, I don't know. Let's go talk to a lawyer. Somebody knows about this stuff. And so I took them. I mean, I had somebody come on the second day and teach them how to public speak. I mean, I had to be very thoughtful and intentional so that they could articulate these ideas that they had to adults and they, the adults would take them seriously. But because they were the ones that were all jab, these kids, once you give them a little bit of power, they are crazy. They are not letting it go. They are full steam ahead, like, yes, we can. And they, so for me, it was about me and the other experts. Like, they were all over us, emailing, phone calls, like, we need you to come back and tell us this. Like, how do we do this? What's the next thing? So they have more time than adults do to, like, focus all of their energy and fury on what they want. So what she's talking about is ownership. Co-ownership is what we're really looking for. You guys, you know, you guys, 
the grassroots, right? I mean, the reason your thing kept going is because you did it. Right? You owned it. You damn well we're going to have it keep going, right? When it's bottom up, grassroots, when people feel like they co authored and co ownership, and that's what the embedded in the design process, your energy is in it. You know, your life is in it. So you're going to stick with it. You're not going to wait around to hear about what's next. When you say embedded in the design process, you're not just talking, I don't I think you're just talking about the, the design that's on paper. You're also embedded them in the design of the program so that you, if, you know, we're, we're kicking off a new program in Houston called Complete Communities. And before we even knew what it was, before we, months before we even presented it to the public, we had been talking with four or five or six people in those communities asking them, what should this look like? Here are our ideas, what do you think about it? So that they had already designed the project before the public heard about it. And so now they're committed and they're, they're bought into it. And now they're ambassadors for the rest of their community. Uh, I'll just add to that. I want to just reiterate what Bill said earlier about tactical urbanism being a, a really powerful opportunity. One of the things that we're, we've been doing a downtown place making effort. And one of the things we're doing this summer is just we're trying a lot of things. And the, I think the important part for us is that we're, we're telling people at the end of the summer, we're going to talk about this. So we don't expect everything to be a success. We don't expect you to like everything. We're just trying as many things as we can. And then we're going to talk. And then we're going to figure it out. And then we're going to try to get the city doing fewer of these things. And we're going to refine things and fix them for next year. And uh, but, but come explore or come see it and think of the city as laboratory rather than as um, you know the, the smart people got it right the first time. We don't think that's actually going to help us work. So I have just a question about trust. I practice law up in Calgary, and I received a file, very controversial housing for the formerly homeless file, conversion of a hotel. And at that time, for at least two years, there had been a theme that there was no trust with the developer. And that was constantly reinforced. And there were there was all sort of embellishment around that theme. However, in my view, it appeared to be that that was the theme from the start because there was actually video on the internet of the conversation with the president <coughs> right after the very first meeting, and that was what was said at that meeting. And so it basically was something that started then, and then that was the reason why to reject that operator that they had not had any experience with previously. So when we're talking about trust, making trust with the community, the question is when you have certain themes that people grab onto and then they make it, we can't get along with you because we don't like you, we don't trust you, this sort of thing, then what do you do? It seems to me and, and there were lots and lots of people in the community who were quite happy with it, but very vocal people who said this sort of thing. So sometimes when I hear that, I've had similar circumstances come to me, hey, can we do a charrette to solve this? And by the way, a charrette can't solve that. There are things you have to do in a community sometimes before you're ready to do a charrette. And so my go-to on this, I always refer people to the work of the Consensus Building Institute at MIT. They're the uh, uh, NDS people. And they, they work with communities on very big divides where people are not trusted. And they use a mutual gains approach. And essentially, they come in as a third party. And I don't know if you don't have to hire them or whatever, but there's a, there has to be some dialogue going on a lot of discussion and a process take people, well, what are the mutual points, the mutual game points, and then starting to work with people to try and find some points in mutual until you get a trusting dialogue going together, then maybe you can do a charrette. So I don't call it conflict resolution, they call it a mutual gains consensus building approach, which is the same thing that happens in charrettes, it's the same thing we do. But I would just refer you to the consensus census, but I, I hand it off to them sometimes and say, you handle this one. Because uh, the elephant in the room is too big for sure. I think that sometimes there are projects that certain people are simply advanced. Mm -hmm. And they use that as the reason, but not the reason. The trust is not the reason. It's that project and those things that go on. Well, there may always
always be people who will never go along with it, but there's a longer discussion on how you you get everybody else involved. So I, I, I always prickle when I hear like, well, you know, they're just never going to get on board. It's so condescending and dismissive of us. Like, we have real reasons that we're unhappy. And as a community member, I feel like it's the, it only makes us more angry that you like roll your eyes and say, oh, that's just another NIMBY. I had to learn that word. And I was like, I think they're calling us names. Like, so just know that you're, yes, it's tough. And I find myself as a professional because I've been on the receiving end of the condescension and I've been the angry person. What I know that when I go into communities, I do disaster recovery. So I go in when it's like, it's typically poor communities of color that have been hit repeatedly by disasters. And the bulk of the city is not of that demographic makeup. And the city council is definitely not of that makeup, nor is usually the mayor or the city manager. And there have been decades of ongoing redlining and disinvestment and strategic racism that has been institutionalized in communities. So I am going into a super hotbed hostile environment almost every single time. The way that I diffuse the bombs that I walk into, like one community just a few months ago I was called into, and somebody said, you know that they are like they have the police now at their city council meetings because they are afraid that like throwing chairs are going to get thrown. And I was like, I mean, how big is this community? 8,000 people. And so I went in, and what I find that I actually act as is more of a marriage counselor than anything. One, when I walked in and I watched the people yelling at city council, yes, they were being super disrespectful. City council wasn't making eye contact with anybody. They literally were kicked back in their chairs, like wouldn't even give them the respect to have eye contact with them. So I had to have like a come to Jesus with the city council to be like, and I'm like the new consultant, I'm like, hey guys, so maybe I was thinking, well, eye contact would be good. When I came in, I let the people yell at me for a solid hour and a half. They just screamed and yelled at me. They were pissed, and they should be, because they were being disrespected by everyone in leadership. <coughs> it took me three city council meetings. They, we didn't get to necessarily a home by a happy place, but by the third city council meeting, no one was yelling and eye contact was being made and people were at least having some reasonable conversation. It is, it is about just listening. You heard like everyone in that said listen, 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 listen. Listen. Hear them. Respect the fact that they're pissed for a reason. Ask why. Ask why three times. Why? And they're going to tell you things. Why for that? Another thing. Why for that? And then you've got a root thing that you can start to work with. Um, so I have a question about the tactical urbanism techniques. So for that, do you do advertising in the community that you're in the area that you're going to do, like post flyers or some letters, and then um, as you're obviously gathering feedback that day, do you have mechanisms set up to gather feedback after? Well, I can't answer all that because we haven't done it yet, <laughs> or we're about to. Um, we, we did, a, it, this is for our downtown, um, so it's a little different than going into uh, one particular neighborhood or a residential area. Um, so we, we've had a, a larger community process, uh, getting ideas from people, and it's it's uh, it's been a lot of a lot of engagement, a lot of conversations. So people, uh, most people know that something's happening, and, um, and not enough people, I'm sure. But uh, but so that it's, it's been a fairly public thing, and then uh, we are working on, on trying to come up with a handful of different ways to do um, to do monitoring and feedback opportunities along the way, as well as um, as uh, using kind of the off season, the, the fall, winter, and spring to, to um, talk more broadly and, and refine those ideas and, and get it better for next summer. Just one question. Yeah. Um, thank you. This is just kind of follow up on the conversation we're having about not everyone is going to get on board with a particular um, idea or process or program. Sometimes. Um, I work for a local government, District of Columbia, and um, the community gives us pushback in no uncertain terms. If it's a project that they don't support, we know firsthand, okay, we don't support this. So it's not like we, say we give up on that community, but we go back and think about, okay, how can we do this differently? Or how can we get by from the community on the project? What kind of design or what kind of, um, you know, what, what negotiations, what will, it, what will it take? 
But the number one factor is trust. We have uh, eight wards in our city, and I'm in the African American community. It's called East of the River, Ward 7 and Ward 8. Um, the trust is the main thing. I have to go to community meetings. I have to go to their homes. I have to go to the churches. I, they know me. So if there's a project that's controversial, the city may not be able to develop that particular project, but it will make the city leaders go back and rethink how that project could be a better project. We don't know everything, and it takes a lot sometimes for local, folk, local government agencies to realize they don't know everything. But the community does. They, they live there. They're on the front line. They're dealing with every, whatever the issue is on a daily basis. So trust absolutely is the number one thing. And number two is we don't know as a government everything. So we do need to go back and rethink how we do business. Good point. And we're, we're almost out of time. We've got a few more questions. Here. That's just more of a, a comment about the trust issue being uh, tricky if there's no structure that gives power to people at the community level. I live in New York City, we have community boards that have no power, it's advisory. People who volunteer for them are treated with contempt, like why would you waste your time? It's advisory. City planning is just going to do what they want anyway. So it, the lack of power creates a structure of furious nimbyism everywhere. People are just so angry because they have no way to actually control their built environment. So I think maybe some cities have a little more structure at the board level or at community level where there is real decision-making authority where you do work for. Maybe nobody does in the whole country, but I'm sure somebody must. And, but you know, big places don't. And we have this heritage of charrettes and workshops which fail every time. I think East Harlem is a big one right now. Anyway, I just want to comment that trust isn't enough. People need some power at the local level. I mean, power sometimes is realizing that your input has an impact. And the feedback loops, you know, like I said, first people come in and we don't trust you. Then, oh my gosh, they are kind of listening. And then, okay. And then, so, it's the listening and it's the feedback to show them you're listening. To show them that their ideas do land somewhere and are heard. People need to be listened to, they need their people. We're in the midst of uh, developing a design guidelines process for uh, our historic districts in a specific area of Houston that's got a lot of development going on. And there's, it's, a, it's an area that the young folks are moving in and want to change, um, want, want the historic character, but they want the historic character with 5,000 square foot houses. And the old folks are you know, clawing onto those little 1,800 square foot shacks that they, Anyway, um, and what we've done, we have a consultant that's working with us, and she takes every single question at every single meeting, and she gets an answer for it, whether it has anything to do with her job or not, whether it's just a complaint, she'll respond, and she, we publish it all, we send it out in mail, we make sure that every single person's question is answered, and they're all answered with, did I answer your question, or can I help you in some other way? And often we get third and fourth questions back from those people. You actually publish the question and the specific answer? Yes. aggregating any Each question gets published and each answer gets published. And it's a big old thing on our website. We post it, we, you know, we do a lot of things to it. And I, so this last picture that I pulled up here, and you talk about power. Um, this is a picture of the mayor standing back and letting the young people like I have I think the next one is like him. You know, I love this because this is him handing the microphone to a 16 year old to speak so that he can listen. And this was very symbolic and it actually meant something because this was the first of many times that they stood and adults listened. And it it made a difference. And it made a difference in those 20 young people that there are six of them that really held on to this, but six out of 20, that's a pretty high success rate for six of them to go forth and like change the way that they engage and that they want to run for elected office and that they want to become a developer in their neighborhood that they're from. They don't want to run off to Austin. 
now they have a vision for what they want their neighborhood to be. And this was really impressive. For them to see that they were being seen as the experts, and again, the, the adults started to step back and be like, we're not, we're not touching this for sabotage. We're going we're gonna to do whatever is necessary. And so there, ha there does have to be a shift in power, a real one. And I think that there's a way to create that. This is a great way to wrap up the uh, conversation. So thank you all, panelists. You all have uh, uh, some incredible expertise. And oftentimes, the path of, to the project is more important than the outcome of the project. And, size and so um, there's a great uh, group of people up here I want to just point out one more time that Helsinki spent hundreds of thousands of dollars creating a comp plan and and this group that what did you guys call yourselves urban Helsinki, urban Helsinki went and, and you know went around the process circumvented it, and created a plan that was so much better the city adopted the plan that was done by the community a comprehensive master plan and that is impressive Thank you, and um, if, uh, please join us at the New Urbanist Film Festival is going on and the uh, Next Gen Happy Hour is going on too. So. Oh, and there are, I have a Saturday oh, session ladies. from 12.30 to 1.45, and there will be two 16-year-old women speaking on the panel from their, their truth and their expertise. So I encourage you to come. It's the only session during lunch on Saturday, Sam. <laughs>